Today's cool. episode of Another Carolina Podcast is brought to you by Hyatt Place Harbison. Hey, this is where your ad can go if you ever want to sponsor any of these episodes of Another Carolina Podcast. Wes, why don't you tell us a little bit about Hyatt Place Harbison? Yeah, Hyatt Place Harbison has been a longtime sponsor of Gamecock Central, and uh, they actually offer special discounted ad rates to Gamecock Central subscribers. Uh, i got a number of friends and uh, members that I've gotten to know over the years that have stayed there, and once they stay there, they almost always go back when they're in town. Uh, they have special rates for uh, football games, uh, special daily rates as well. So if you're coming into town for men's basketball, the final two home games, coming into town for baseball now that baseball season has started, spring game, or even for the 2019 football season, they already have special rates. That is at 1130 Kinley Road, Irmo, South Carolina, 29063 here in the Columbia area. It's Hyatt Place, Columbia Harbison. They're a proud, longtime Gamecock Central sponsor, so we're glad to have them on the podcast today. If you want to be a sponsor of the podcast, be sure to get in touch with Chris or Wes. They'll be able to get you all the details on that. And for everybody else, thanks again for listening, as always. And just wanted to remind you that if there's something you like, you want us to do more of it, it really helps. If you rate, review, subscribe, be sure to share it with your friends as well. Thanks for listening. Here we go. Another great episode of another Carolina podcast for you. A little bit of a snow, slow news week, but we are less than a week away from the start of football season for some people. I'm going to go ahead and put myself in that list. South Carolina spring practice starts a week from Wednesday. Also, South Carolina basketball in a really interesting stretch run here in the SEC. But we start today with a couple recruiting notes. We have the local recruiting experts, Chris Clark and Wes Mitchell, as always with me, Pearson Fowler. If you want to catch my local show on 107.5 The Game, you can do that weekdays from 12 to 1. One. Guys, we had a couple Carolina 2020 possible commits in town for South Carolina this weekend. How did those official visits go for these young men? <clears throat> well, they had several guys in town. Um, the biggest one, um, you know, for an overnight trip, second one of, of this calendar year was Tank Bigsby out of Georgia. Um, he's a guy that four-star prospect, ranked number 31 in the country, regardless of position by Rivals.com. Um, a huge, obviously, priority for the Gamecock staff, given their need at running back. Um, three seniors or two seniors at running back and, and another in A.J. Turner who could really play defensive back or running back this year. But those guys will all be departing, sort of a wide-open race. And so Tank's been a guy that they've been recruiting hard. South Carolina's in a good position, but he's going to probably continue taking some visits into the spring, uh, into the summer, and then render a decision no later than the summer. But it was another really good trip um, by all indications. And then uh, Jaheim Bell, who's a six foot three, 210-pounder out of Georgia, um, I know Wes can talk about him a little bit more, having having talked to him after that visit. But he's a he's a tight end type. Um, Demarcus Beckwith, who's a tight end prospect out of Alabama, who's a really really good athlete, um, a guy that South Carolina I think made a move with um, as well. And then we saw out of the twenty twenty one class, Jack Coleyfield, who's a guy who could play linebacker, defensive end, or tight end at the next level from the twenty one class. Dax Holyfield, Virginia Tech signee, former Gamecock uh, target at linebacker. Uh, that's his younger brother. So several guys in town that I think they were able to do some good work with. Yeah, and I, I think uh, Michael Wyman in on yep. Friday, uh, four-star receiver that South Carolina has really positioned themselves in in a good spot with. Um, you know, I, I think they're in the lead right now. Continues to pick up offers. Ohio State offered earlier this week. Um, you know, just every single week he's gotten big offer after big offer. But South Carolina in in great shape right now with him. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I think we talked about him as being sort of on commit watch um, before, you know, he came in, and mm-hmm. I, I still would have him on commit watch. I, I think with these guys, sometimes it's just about logistics, um, you know, when they actually do commit, and I, I think he's a kid that South Carolina has positioned themselves in a, in a spot where you w- really wouldn't be surprised if he pulled the trigger on a commitment at, at some point fairly soon. Do you all ever hear anything negative after these things? I mean, over the years, like maybe every now and then. Every now and then. Because I, I feel mean, like everyone just comes out of these and they're like, oh, yeah, it was great. Have a good relationship with the coach. The blah was good. This was good. Blah, <laughs> blah, blah. I mean, yeah. how much insight do you guys actually get from talking to these guys after visits, especially when you're early in the recruiting process like these guys? We're talking about 2020 recruits here. I mean, in terms of from the – it depends on the prospect. I mean, the recruiting market now is so um, oversaturated, I would say, that, you know, not only these kids have, uh, you know, coaches from colleges and even from, heck, even from high schools, I mean, uh, you know, hitting them up, specifically college coaches, of course, and support staffers, um, 
you know, they get media types like us, and, and we try not to blow kids up, you know, of course. But but they get guys like us who are, you know, after they visit, we're trying to catch up with them and, and sort of see where things stand, get interviews with them. That's part of our job. And so there's a lot of them, you know. I mean, there's a lot of media types or people who are sort of attempting to be media types um, who are hitting these kids up. And so it gets oversaturated. A lot of them don't like to talk as much. You know, it used to be back in the day it was a little bit easier there are some other aspects where there's more stuff that kids put on social media now. They put themselves out there a little bit more because of social media, so it sort of balances it out a little bit. But some prospects are more guarded than others. A lot of times you're going to get, you know, nobody's in the lead. Um, you know, and generally the visits do go well because, look, these are fun trips. You know, mm-hmm. sort of like if you go to an amusement park, you're probably going to have a good time. <laughs> you know, these guys, when they're taking visits to places with coaches that are loving up on them and uh, they got great facilities and, a lot of good things going on. They're going to have a good time on the trip because of how the trip's structured. Every now and then something goes awry. I mean, that hap- that's happened at South Carolina. That's happened at a lot of other places, Alabama, Georgia, I mean, wherever. And so um, some kids will tell you some things a little bit behind the scenes, but a lot of it for us, Wes, is about trying to find out what we can aside from just talking to the kid. If that's all we relied on, I don't think we would know as much. I mean, there's value in talking to the kids, but – Oh, we'd be screwed. Yeah, I mean, there there wouldn't be as much <laughs> if if we just went based off what they told us. I mean, yeah, I, I think a lot of a lot of it is just about sorting through the noise, and you don't always as much as um, we wish we had it all instantly, and as much as some of our readers wish we had it instantly, you don't always really get the full story instantly, and and it is ever changing. So, um, you know, I I try to look at it. Okay, the visit went well everywhere. How did this visit compare to other visits? If we can get that information, <laughs> what feedback have we heard that that prospect is giving non-media people, whether uh-huh. it be a high school coach, a trainer, a college coach, et cetera? And then how close is said prospect to making a decision? And that that's something I've tried to pay more attention to lately because having a lead for a guy who's going to decide in December really – maybe doesn't mean much of anything, but having a lead for a guy who's like ready to decide um, fresh off of a visit, then I, I think that means a bit more. And then, hey, how, are there more visits to come? If You know, if South Carolina's in the lead for a guy, but he's got five more visits planned, that's a different situation than he's got South Carolina leads, we're hearing he's ready to make a decision, and we're hearing he's not going to take any other visits. That's a little bit more of a, a simple scenario, I think. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes these guys will – I mean, look, I have no – and I know how it is. I mean, guys give interviews and they'll say, you know, nobody's out in front. And we will have a piece of information to where we know that's not the case. You know, it's not the kid's really trying to mislead us. He's just not wanting to say as much about it. And that's understandable because whatever they put out in a forum like that um, for a public interview is going to be disseminated as sort of where things stand. And, and oftentimes they don't want to say as much. But you get those situations. Sometimes kids are – completely forthcoming which is fine too of a, this school's in the lead or I, this is my top five whatever it may be but like Wes said we sort of have to use some discernment just based on experience and, and based on the kids I mean there's some kids that even to college coaches or high school coaches people who are very close to them they won't have a clue what, what the kid's thinking because most of the times that adds up to the kid doesn't know the family doesn't know sometimes you get guys who will deliberately you know, sort of play games with the media, and that's fine. I, I remember, and I can say this now because he's moved on from, from college, but Arden Key was one where he put out, you know, th- this is a guy who had decommitted from South Carolina two different times, recommitted, eventually signed with LSU. And uh, he put out a top five at one point, and I can't – was it Oregon West that was number one? Who was – I can't remember. It was some random – it's a top five. South Carolina was number five. And I knew, based on some other stuff I'd heard, that South Carolina was still in the lead. And I asked Arden off the record about it, and he said, yeah, I'm putting out this top five, basically just to downplay, just to, just to have some fun with the process. He said, South Carolina's going to be number five, but that's really who's in the lead. And it so was basically in reverse like order, that. wasn't it? It was reverse order. Yeah, I think like Oregon was number one or something. I mean, it, it was something strange. So you get those situations, too, at times. And um I think people get worked up about that, which, I mean, yeah. of course, I think is is silly because they're just having fun with the process, and the, the whole process is, you know, almost a farce at this point. It, it seems like it seems like the the process of recruiting now is almost a commentary on the process of recruiting. It's very uh, kind of a meta thing, but I, I guess what what it sounds like you're saying, and what I would imagine to be the case, is that 
it's it's as different as just you and I are. You and Wes and I are all like very different people and we share different levels of information. Some people are more shy. Some people are more outgoing. Like if I ask you how your day is, Chris, I'm going to get like a pretty good report on how your day is. But Wes, I'm going to have to do a little bit more digging. You know, it's just some people you got to work a little more to get information out of them. So obviously you guys do a great job at, at what you do. And, is that true? Huh? Is that true? I don't know. I, I feel or, like maybe a little bit. He's huh. basically saying I, I talk too much. Yeah. Which is entirely well possible. no i mean like i feel bad because i i feel like i talk way more than both of you guys and sometimes i feel bad for talking too much but is that true too that he talks more than us not here because you guys oh. are the experts so i try to give you the floor because i don't know what i'm talking about i just i just try to be a good host and get get the heck out of the way but um <laughs> I, just just to use an example i don't know maybe it's i don't know wes i feel like i don't know as much about you as i do about chris we're gonna have to have a like heart to heart powwow get together. <laughs> need to know your life story. I feel like I know Chris's life story better I'm than your life story. I'm still upset you didn't take me to Dave Chappelle. As part uh, of that. So look, look. If I you'd have taken me there, then we'd be best friends. It was it's a, a good tough bonding ticket. opportunity. Yeah. I mean, well, the yeah. thing is, I what didn't happens? even buy the ticket, so you're gonna have to fuss at uh, Andrew Mason Dixon of the Andrew Mason know. Dixon lines. Yeah, so. exactly. So, <laughs> uh, so obviously, like I said, y'all are great at this. Y'all are good at reading between the lines, deciphering it. If if a guy says, "Oh, you know, this weekend was great," you're you're good at then either tempering the expectations for fans that get too excited on the boards or saying, oh, actually, he had a great time. So are there keywords that you look for? Are there certain, like, phrases, trends, like little giveaways, or is that as varied as the prospect himself? Uh, I don't think so. There's not, like, a trick that you all use that's like, oh, he he said this? That's like, that, that tipped us off that actually he had a bad time this week. Or I actually, mean, you, you can, you know, maybe that's kid, something we need to start doing. I yeah, mean, Pierce I'm not is giving look, us tips no. now. I'm not well, no, but it would make sense. I mean, this this is like poker. You don't want to give you don't want to give away your tell. So I understand if you want to keep it, you know, private for business. I, th- I think some kids can, at times, sort of give it away. I mean, if they go visit a place five or six times and they've only been to another place like once, yeah, you know, and then they're saying that follow those the schools are even. Yeah, I mean, you follow the visits to a degree. You've also got a kid where if he says, "Look, the, you know, the number one factor in my decision is going to be." I want to go play for a coach who's got an NFL track record. Well, you know, generally, you're going to look a little bit more to those schools. Now, you know, d- there's a lot of different factors that go into the pot. I mean, really, and so um, it, it is tougher at times to get stuff from the kids directly. I, I I can say in our experience, especially as of late, in the last several years, it's been much more about getting stuff from other places aside from the kids. And I think that's been reflective in some of the stuff that like, we reported. Like I look back on, you know, just thinking of a few, you know, or Trey Smith mm-hmm. or Jamias Williams or Zach Pickens, some situations where I guess the maybe the casual line of thinking is is people looked at Zach Pickens and they went, he's a five-star in Anderson, he's going to Clemson, you know. And Zach, if Zach sort of says some good stuff about Clemson or says things even, well, that's really not where where things were for much of the process. Right. Um, Jemias Williams, a lot of people thought, well, he's going to flip to Georgia. Or or Trey Smith, his mom played for Clemson, he's definitely going there. And so, you know, it, you, you got to find, I think, the information in other places. It doesn't mean we bat a thousand by any means, but I, I think um, – you know that that's it's much more valuable if you have some some places where you can you know get other information and be more plugged in than just talking to the kids because a lot of those kids the ones the ones that I just mentioned didn't do a ton of inter- interviews during mm-hmm. the process. Well, if, if a kid will talk to you off the record too, it's always yeah, and that happens. That yeah. if you if if and when if. that happens, <laughs> that's that's when you a lot of times to me that's when you get that's the real the real deal yeah. story. Yeah, because um, even coming from various sources it can get murky or you'll hear you know for I, sure i remember um trying to think that, and it seems like down the stretch of a recruit if a guy has an announcement set as in okay so so some recruitments they just end right somebody just commits whether on campus or a lot of times they'll be on campus they'll tell a coaching staff they're coming then they go home they sort it out they get their Twitter post ready, and then they just commit. Seems like Zach Pickens kind of fell into that category, right? Kind of a no nonsense, just just business, straightforward. His announcement wasn't with a lot of fanfare, and it wasn't a huge surprise when he committed to South Carolina. To an extent. So then, then there's other guys that have an announcement set, and whenever there's an announcement set, the information just always seems to get murky if it's an actual, somewhat close battle because there's a greater sense of people trying to sort of uh, hide what's going to happen yeah. because there needs to be 
some excitement in the announcement, yeah. I feel like. I mean, I, I remember going into um, the uh, Stefan Wynn announcement, and you know, and it, it really didn't even look like it was South Carolina, but there was just – it was all over the place. It, you know, some people said Georgia, some people said South Carolina, some people said Alabama, and the information was tough to actually sort through. And then that's when you have to start, A, hey, where are you hearing this from? You know, where's the person that's telling you hearing this from? And then almost as important is when – did they hear it? When did they hear it? it was a you big know? one because because Stefan, I remember you call and I think, and I'm not trying to brag. I can brag on Wes because it's not you know me or Pearson. That was a joke, Pearson. Anyway, but but <laughs> Wes called. He you know we did not know for sure was Stefan until the day of, right? But Wes thought from what he had heard, Alabama. I remember mm-hmm. that, and it did change. I mean, there was a time like we we sort of took some flack after that because. At one point, we had reported that South Carolina was in good position, which I'll, I'll go to my grave saying that was the case because we knew specifically what was being said, who it was being told to. Mm-hmm. And it just – it sort of flip-flopped at the end. And I remember we didn't find out. I I, I sort of like Jedi mind-tricked somebody at the announcement to telling me mm-hmm. that it was going to be Alabama, so we sort of knew before. Yeah. Um, we didn't spoil. We just let him go. But, I mean, it, it sort of just verified what Wes had been hearing. But, yeah, that one was an interesting one, for sure. There's been some interesting ones. So yeah. with all your powers of discernment, and maybe this is now, like, the worst time to ask this question, but since, obviously, you guys have just given some examples of, of how you're of how you're good at doing this, was there anybody this weekend that you feel like significantly changed his tune on South Carolina either way? Uh, I mean, I, I, think, I think they came into the weekend good with Tank Bigsby and Michael Wyman, and I think they exited – Good yeah, with those guys right, right. as well. Um, you know, I don't think we have a feel for some of these other guys yet. Because, uh, I mean, that's it's one thing to say that we say positive things about all the visits. Because, I mean, these visits do go well. You're going to look at a new $50 million facility that has, like, everything in it. You're <laughs> going to have fun. You know? Yeah, well, all three of us have been through it now. Yeah. I don't know how you can go in there and not yeah. be absolutely blown away. You're, you're going to have a blast on, on every visit, probably, for the most part. Yeah. But um, I think there's a difference between saying the visit went well and then us being like, well, South Carolina's going to get this kid. I mean, I you know, you look at Jaheim Bell, I think the visit went well, but I, I don't really know that I have a great feel yet for how where South Carolina stands. He's picked up a lot of offers lately. Um, he, what, immediately went to Alabama. Next day. And picked yeah, up an offer Alabama from Alabama. So, yeah. um, you know, if, when that happens, that can, does that overshadow the South Carolina visit, potentially, that you're going to a place like Alabama and they're instantly, you know, offering him. And he's, and some of these guys, some of the, some of the stuff runs together, even for us covering it. But, I mean, I think Jaheim's got like over a dozen offers just since it turned 2019. So he's been blowing up. So does he have a good feel for, um, you know, what he's going to do even? Because a lot of times fans want to know, hey, what, what, what's the guy thinking? Well, the kid may not know at this point. So then we really are just guessing. Who's the most confusing recruitment to follow? I was just trying to think of that. The most confusing or the hardest to decipher? Um, be a tough one. That's a good question. It's a stumper. It was so <laughs> when Marcus Lattimore, when he named Auburn his remember him naming Auburn his leader after yeah. the South Carolina official. Yeah, and like, then he put on the Auburn hat during like his that, announcement. Like thing. Pulled it out. Yeah. yeah. Now, see, another. by the announcement, from what I remember, I believe we all yeah we knew. thought it was South Carolina. You know, felt really really good about it being South Carolina. Right, right off of his South Carolina official. He named Auburn his leader. And yeah. I never <laughs> – Yeah. I never – do you know if that was just throwing people off the scent or was that I don't, real? No, I, I don't know. Um, we need I to know, ask him. We do need to ask him. We should bring him in here on, uh, <laughs> yeah. on the podcast one day. That would be great. I do remember this about Marcus. When he was like a sophomore, so, I mean, he had started to sort of blow up, but I, I used to be able to call him and talk to him for a long time, you know, and, and we always had a pretty good relationship during the process, but – um when it started getting down to the wire, like the last maybe, I can't remember the time frame, so long ago, 2010. So this was in 2009. Mm-hmm. 
and, and into 2010, he sort of went radio silent. I mean, wouldn't respond, which is fine. I'm not mad at him about it, but wouldn't respond to calls or texts. And and then all of a sudden, I don't remember what day of the week his 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 signing day announcement was. It was not on signing day, right? It was maybe like it was a day before. Day before, yeah. So it was on a Tuesday, I guess. I think it was the day before. Yeah, it it was close to it. So let's say it was the day before on like a Tuesday. Signing day would have been Wednesday in February. So say it was on a Tuesday. It was like either Saturday or Sunday. He texted me out of the blue. Had not heard from him in forever. And he's just like, I made my decision, I'm going to South Carolina. I was like, oh, okay. Which I, I was fairly confident in that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, if Marcus is listening. Yeah. Sorry that I spoiled that, but I think it's okay now to, yeah. to sort of reveal that. It's been a few years. That. Yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been a while. But but Marcus was not the most confusing. That, was that the most confusing for you? Is I would that what say you're the saying? most confusing. Because no. at just, the end, you sort of knew. It was, it was just interesting how everybody, kind of, like, Carolina, I feel like we thought Carolina was the pick Yeah. for most of the time, but but it was... It wasn't really certain till the end. Cl- Clowney, you know, you felt like South Carolina was in good shape for a long time, but then there was always this thing about, well, Alabama is still right there. Alabama's right there. Then you have the late Clemson, Clemson made the push. push, and you're like, is this real or not? Yeah, um, yeah. And, I mean, Marcus had a weird, like, potpourri of schools where he, it's Auburn, then, he had, <laughs> then he's got Oregon. You remember Oregon was on his list for a long time. Oregon was there. Uh, they 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 fell off eventually, but they were like in the top yeah. five for a while. Then you had Penn State. Clemson was actually his first offer, I think, when he was a freshman or sophomore. Um, so what's your weirdest one? I, I've been trying to think of it. I, Arden you Key, asked the question. Arden Key was weird. You know, it wasn't that confusing because you know it, it was it was sort of confusing to follow just because when a kid decommits and recommits twice. Mm-hmm. I think he was like one of the first ever re decommitments. Um, re decommitments. So and then a de recommit, right? <laughs> de recommit. Y'all are above my. Yes. He, he yes. re decommitted right. and, right. and then de recommitted. Yeah. No, I, mm, you know, another one that was sort of tough at the end was Channing Tindall was tough at the end for a little while. Yeah, but I'm going to say. I, yeah, you know, you, you knew it was Georgia, I, but but it got a little. No, my, mm. it's, it's bad. My I feel like my best quality. Is sniffing out when someone's not when going something's to gone wrong. Something's yeah. going wrong. It's like yeah. I, I my told, humility. I was like, Stefan Wynn's not coming to South Carolina. Right? Like, <laughs> really? Uh huh. Like no. Then I because I told you a couple of months before I was like Channing Tunnel was not coming to South Carolina, and at the time it was like, and you had some info as to why. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, oh, yeah. and we're was, just guessing. Yeah, it was well sourced, but I, I feel like my that's like. For whatever reason, that's the stuff I dig up. It's like he's not going there. I don't know where he's going. They remember the Drew Barker, maybe the most famous of all time. I, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not going there. No, but but I mean that curse has been long broken. <laughs> oh, I never thought it was a curse, but still, you you sniff that one out. I did. Wes has cursed <laughs> some recruits, or but, the there was always program? this running joke about how if Wes went to an. I mean, did it even happen? Oh, oh yeah, that's once? right. We talked about this right before, right before you went to Florida. I guess right before you went to Orlando, we talked about how you, you were bad luck. You, well, was yeah, it, but I. I it but was I, only that one time, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't I've, even remember any. I've other. been. I covered. I covered Darrell Scott's announcement, but that was because I covered it for. Yeah, you the knew network. He, yeah, you knew yeah, he was going to Tennessee. We were, yeah, but some people took it as me going meant. You know, oh, that was going the reason. To South Carolina, you know. Oh, right, yeah, beforehand, because yeah. automatically people think if if somebody covering the team is going, that's a sign. Which, I mean, a lot of times, ninety percent of the time, yeah, it is. But um, yeah, the Drew Barker thing for a while haunted me, especially on Twitter. Um, <laughs> it's easy for things to Twitter haunt people on Twitter. People on Twitter aren't totally reasonable. Yeah, I don't. Th- I don't think the Drew Barker yeah. thing haunted you on Twitter. I think people on Twitter haunted you. <laughs> I think that's probably a better way to say that. That's probably true. Recruiting is a 365-day-a-year sport, and I'm sure glad I have these guys to help me break it down because I, I c- couldn't do it, have no interest in doing it, couldn't do it if I wanted to. So I'm glad uh, we have you here to do it for us, Chris and Wes. Uh, what is not a 365-day sport and a uh, short season, short, exciting season, and especially now that Carolina's got five games left, is college basketball. South Carolina beat Ole Miss. Beat Ole Miss pretty handily despite, despite starting the game very sloppily. Uh, end up winning the game by 15. They're now 9-4 and four in the SEC and will will likely be favored in at least four of their last five games, putting themselves in a great position to make the NCAA tournament despite having you know, as bad a performance in their non-conference schedule as I can remember for South Carolina basketball. I mean, yeah, they scheduled some good teams, but, boy, they had some just 
horrible results. The loss to Wyoming, the loss to Oklahoma State. Wofford even isn't a bad loss at this point, but at the time that felt pretty damning. Uh, same with Stony Brook, not like the terrible loss because they've had themselves a pretty nice season. But uh, anyway, you cut it. South Carolina had a very disappointing non-conference performance, but their conference performance has been just incredible and, and almost unprecedented based on the way that they started the season. But like I said, now five games away. I'll put it to you this way. I'll start with you, Chris. What percentage chance would you put it that South Carolina makes the NCAA tournament today? Ooh. Today being Thursday, February the 21st. I'm going to put it at 50-50. Either it'll happen or it won't. That's how I work all probabilities. Is that, is that your rationale or you really think it's like a 50% chance? No, I mean, I, I do think I, – I see that more as it could go either way because – I mean, the, the obvious, like, really stupid, no research answer is like, well, maybe they don't win some games and then they're not <laughs> going to get in. Obviously, if they don't, if they don't take care of business down the stretch, they're not getting in. Then it's like a zero percent chance, you know. <laughs> so all right, so you were not, you were not good at math. You were not good at but, probability back in well, the day. Well, look, all right. So I do think <laughs> South Carolina is going to do well. I think they win. They have at Mississippi State, Alabama yeah. at home. They have Missouri and Texas A and M on the road, and then Georgia at home. Yeah, I mean, they've got five games left and then the SEC tournament. Which they're th- almost certainly going to get a double bye for at this point. They have a two-game lead over everybody except for Ole Miss, and they have the tiebreaker over Ole Miss. So that's effectively a two-game lead. I think they take four of the next five. Okay. I like it. Mm-hmm. So I'll give that a high percentage. What You make it what you want. I think so there's now, a 100% so four, chance four they make the it four or puts five. Them, puts them at 13-5 and five in conference. Yes. And then you go to the tournament, double bye. In that in that scenario, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know, I don't, you know, say they take a game there. Then I think they, you know, can I say? That sounds for like sure, more though? than fifty percent. Just give it fifty-one. Yeah. I, I was given the fifty percent chance based on the fact that they don't win. If they win four or five, which I think is most likely, do you think, yeah, then so I you say think they will like seventy-five percent? Oh, seventy-five. There we go. If I they win it. four or five, and if they win one game in the tournament, oh, so they got to have a tournament win too. But you think they will? That, I'm gonna say yes that's, because that's, I mean, what gosh, are you projecting still, for this team? You're projecting I'm, four and five down the stretch and one, one win SEC in the tournament. tournament, one win and done in the tournament. Wesley, all right. So I think they have a 19.6 percent chance. Right? Oh, now. you're looking at that stupid uh, website. And I called tournament. my show and mentioned yesterday. That's uh, that's terrible. That's, no, I love this website. No. Um, so I just I went 19 percent. I said I said 71. Hold on, for what it's worth, 71. It's 19. That's that's right now in life. Their percentage. Okay, okay. If if they yeah. do the thing I like about this is it gives you a breakdown if they so in your scenario, okay. if they win four more games and win eighteen total games, with this is without this is without the North the, Greenville win, which doesn't count. No, this is without the, the tournament win. No, 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 this is without the tournament win. They're okay. including they're including just all wins for, for Well these the North purposes. Greenville one's not gonna count. It doesn't count for the committee, but this right. is just how they have it charted out. So 18 total wins, which is your scenario without the tournament win, puts it at 54.1%. That's based on basically all the other brackets ever and sort of similar outcomes. But if you add, so if you subtract one win from that, it goes all the way down to 11%, which, okay, they don't make it. But if you add in the tournament win that you're talking about, it balloons all the way up to eighty eight point nine percent. So, so basically yeah. four and one, and done in the tournament with no wins, gets you at about a coin flip. Right, Anything right. less than that, it's not happening. Anything more than that, they're probably in just based on their simulation. Okay, so we have some numbers, we have some simulations, but that doesn't answer my question, Wes. What percentage <laughs> chance do you give South Carolina to make the NCAA tournament right now today? Uh, say forty one percent. Forty one percent. Okay, yes. cool. That's higher. So, so than what do you 10. think they're going down? The is it three of five and no win in the tournament? Is that what you got? Or four and one and lose their first game in the tournament? Yeah. Like, what's your scenario um, there? Man, it. I'll, I'll say this. If and I'm gonna answer the question, but if if they win Saturday, like to me, that's the that's the key. That's the one you circle first. You had to win at the, Mississippi State. Yeah, first, more than yeah. home against Alabama on Tuesday. Yeah, because I I think if they if they win Saturday, then you look at what's left and you say they probably are favored in all four of those games, and now you have a little tiny bit of margin for error as opposed to having none if you lose that game because so, of the quality of the win. Yeah, I guess, it's yeah. well, and just the fact of 
in our scenario, we're saying four and one. If you already mm-hmm. if you give them that loss there, then they basically are saying you have to go four and zero right, yeah. the rest of the way. If you win Saturday, then you know you're three and one, and the fact that two of those games are on the road, um, you know it's not easy to win on the road. This team hasn't played as well on the road, so. But the next five games we're playing are against five of the six bottom teams in the SEC. Yeah, but we've seen close games. No, we in have, SEC and, play, and Carolina and should have happens. probably lost some games to the teams that they ended up beating that were worse than them. But they're playing so well right now. They're playing with confidence. They're shooting the ball well. And the thing that impressed me most about the win against Ole Miss the other day was how well the defense played. Because it's a mm-hmm. it's a good offensive team from Ole Miss. They shoot the three ball often and well. And South Carolina did an excellent job defending that. That's what's sort of been missing. And Frank Martin had said as much earlier in the season that you know, while the offense was playing well, while they're they're the best three point shooting team in the SEC since conference play started, but the defense was lagging behind. I think we saw it start to click for a couple of guys. Uh, you know, Keyshawn Bryan and AJ Lawson, I think both had good defensive games against Ole Miss on Tuesday. So that is what I look at and say. I, I'm I'm closer to you, Chris. Like I said, I, I give them about a 71 percent chance to win because I I think they're playing well enough offensively, and and the way that the defense seems to be rounding into form. I, I'm very optimistic at this point. What why? Do y'all know anybody know Wyoming's record and or net rank? So it's like three hundred. They have four wins. Is that right? Six. They have six. six well, last time 20. I checked, it was four because early in the season they had beaten uh, Grambling. <laughs> they beat Grambling. They beat uh, Drexel, and they beat some place in Utah called uh, Dixie State. They were the Dixie State Rebels. Would not have guessed that was in Utah. Also, did go. not know that was a school. But that was my favorite fun fact for like a week. The, the Dixie State Rebels that, is a school in Utah. Net rankings three nineteen. Ah, that's bad, bad loss. Stony Brook is 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 a bad loss as classified by Colin Taylor of GamecockCentral.com fame. Uh, he's got a really good piece on this, but uh, they're they're number one fifty two in the net rankings. That's not great. They are twenty one and five and nine and two in the American East in second yeah. place. Um, the Wyoming one and the Oklahoma State games really kill you, especially the Oklahoma State one because that was. In the middle of the season, you know, you can at least say Wyoming's early in the season. The team's playing a lot better since then, but the, uh, the Oklahoma State one really kind of sticks out like a sore thumb and, a, and otherwise pretty good run of play for Carolina. Yeah, I, th- I feel like, and, and you can always say the what ifs, but you look back and you're just like, they could have one, just one more win out of those bad losses, and it's a, you know, maybe a different conversation. But um, hey, I think the one of the greatest signs though is, and you can say what you want about the bracketology stuff and all that. Usually, I feel like pretty accurate. South Carolina actually being mentioned, and it's it took forever during this little recent run of success for the national guys to even mention South Carolina as a possibility, I think. And now they're listed on Lenardi's uh, next four out. So not even on the last four out yet, but next four out. And but trending in the right direction. Yeah, and the other teams in the last four out are like Florida was in the last four out. I think I saw Alabama was in there too. So South Carolina already has the tiebreaker over Florida. Mm-hmm. They have the opportunity to get the tiebreaker over Alabama next week. And uh, by the time we do this podcast again next Thursday, I think we'll have a much much clearer picture. Obviously, there will only be three games left, but South Carolina will have played Alabama and uh, Mississippi State already with three very very winnable games left. Um, so we'll have a, again a clearer picture when we do this this time next week. Uh, other thing that's happening next week guys is the is this the start of football season for y'all spring practice starts on wednesday it never ends no i don't think okay all right so so football's 365 for y'all i've 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 enjoyed like a little two-month respite but for me this is like when i start to get excited there's a little bit of a lull again there i guess in like may but by june there's like nothing else going on except for like the end of the nba season and so that's when i start to pick up like you know, my athlon sports and start to read up on everything. So this is this really is the start of football season for me. Wes, what is your favorite part of spring practice? Uh, my favorite part is seeing, which we don't always get to see as much as we used to, um, but Just. seeing the, the new guys um, for the first time in a college atmosphere. Uh, personally, I mean, Zach Pickens, Ryan Holinsky, they're the two highest rated guys for a reason. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to see how how do they look in, in that new setting? How do they match up with their teammates? Spring practice for newcomers, I mean, you're thrown in the fire. Like there's gonna be some bad moments. You don't know where you're you're going, you don't know what you're doing yet. But I think especially a guy like Pickens, the athleticism, size, length, speed, it, there will be times where we're hearing about Zach Pickens just taking over, I think. And then Holinsky, you know, I, I think playing in the conference he played in, one of the toughest divisions 
in high school football. You watch his film, dude. He's throwing the ball into tight windows already. And uh, I think that will – not that I think he's going to beat out, uh, you know, Jake Bentley, but how does Helensky's, you know, I guess progress, you could say, but how, how does Helensky's first time out there compare to what on Joyner looks like now that he's had a year within the system? That That would be – some of the more interesting things I'm personally looking forward to. Chris, what's your favorite part of spring? I I would have to say, you know, same as Wes, just in terms of seeing some of the new guys that we've sort of covered and actually being able to see them in that setting would would be my favorite part. In terms of what I'm most intrigued by, maybe, um, you know, Wes mentioned the quarterbacks. He mentioned Joyner. I'm intrigued by Joyner. Of course, I want to see Helensky, what he can do, but – just intrigued to see how much growth there is with Joyner. Again, I don't think anybody's going to displace Jake Bentley as a starter. I don't think there's any reason to anticipate <sighs> that. But with Joyner, um, he's got an interesting skill set to where I, I, I'd have to wonder, is there going to be an effort in his second year now that he's, he's had a little taste of action last season, mm. he's had some time to grow. Um, are they going to find a way to try to get him on the field? this season and so just seeing you know not only his growth just in battling for that backup spot but also is there going to be some other role that he has on this team now we may we'll probably won't get that answered in spring practice because we may not be able to see enough but just if we hear something I'm intrigued by that the offensive line just the shifting that goes on there what combination they settle on because they're replacing some guys there there might be some movement there um and the running back position you know just trying to see how that battle shakes out. Thomas Brown, new coach, new set of eyes. See how the guys respond to him. See how Deshaun Fenwick and Levante Valentine look. Kevin Harris, the freshman. Um, those are some of the positional groups I'm most intrigued to see. I love the spring game, especially when it's actually warm. You know, even if it's just breaking warm before it gets a little bit cold again, before it gets warm for good. But there's there's something, I don't know, just very nostalgic for me because, you know, I grew up going to a bunch of spring games, obviously. It's it's just fun. You sit out there, it's in the sunshine, you get a little bit sunburned because you weren't expecting it to be, like, sunny and warm and you're just watching football and it's it's really nice. So uh, that that's the thing that I most look forward to and I guess a, like most about spring. Always a spring superstar. Yeah. You know, somebody who has, like, 12 catches and It's like game. 50-50 if they are even going to catch a pass. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, though, I don't remember if it was last year or if it was two years ago. Gosh, I don't even know what year he is. Y'all can correct me if if this was last year, not two years ago. But I remember, I think it was two years ago because I didn't even watch the spring game last year. But I remember being very impressed with Keel Pollard's yeah, physicality, with his he, ability to go up and, and get the ball. Out. And then didn't do a whole lot last year, but obviously a, a very deep tight end chart um, last couple of years. And so now we've seen him like sort of emerge onto the scene. So you know, there's there's a little bit you can glean, um, if nothing else, just like the physicality of some dudes, which is really impressive. I also remember uh, Tory Gurley being someone that stuck out in a spring practice just because it's interesting to watch like a six five like basically giraffe run down the field and catch footballs that was always fun um so by this time next week we will have probably two spring practices in the book probably won't have a whole lot of headlines but maybe a a few more thoughts on that Uh, before we get out of here as always like to get to some of your questions there's a thread up on the insiders forum on gamecock central right now and we'll go ahead and start with james robb who has a which happens first question we'll start with chris (laughs) because Wes just pointed at chris and left so which happens first, Chris? Will Muschamp beats Clemson? Ooh, that's a tough one. Or Mark Kingston makes it to Omaha? Mm-mm-mm. Well, all right, so Kingston was one W away. He, he, he was. But I, they – I'm not sold on the pitching. Everybody yeah, I'm not sold year. on the pitching this year. I don't think that happens. But does I'll South Carolina beat Clemson this year? Right. Football? See, See, I look at it two ways. If the question was what's more likely to happen this year, I would say much champ beats Clemson. But I, I don't. I'm, I'm not saying that will happen. Like I, I could see neither of those happening this year. And so, so then, then you got to go the year, next year. You heard it. Chris Clark guarantees victory <laughs> right. over Clemson. Over but Clemson that, and a trip to Omaha next year. That. No, but um, man, that's tough. I, I'm, I'm trying to run through like the roster progression of Clemson and Carolina football in my head. Too. Yeah, you're thinking about you know? this too much. Yeah. <laughs> Just go with your gut. What does your gut say? My gut would probably have to be Kingston to Omaha, don't Ooh. you think? Oh, man. This one's yours, man. But all over South Carolina right now, a bunch of people just got a really sharp heart pain and they don't know why until later they listen to this podcast I think and they realize what Chris Clark just breathed into the air. Well, I say uh, because I look at it this way, I think – Carolina could 
could catch Clemson this year at home. I, I don't know. Don't don't go tweeting that I said that. That's not my game prediction. It's, it's it's February. I'm leaving. Okay, that so in. I have no idea. But Trevor Lawrence could be playing in the Pacific Pro League. There you go. This the time PPL? next year. So yeah, who knows? So so I, I think it's more. It would be out of those two options. I think it would be more likely that that Carolina beat Clemson in football than Kingston make Omaha this year. This West? year, when you go to the next year though. I think Kingston would have a better chance in his third season because then Carolina's playing Clemson at home with presumably if Trevor Lawrence has not moved on to the PPL, he'd be a junior. They're still, they still got a lot of talent coming through there. No, in Clemson, if Lawrence is a junior? Yeah. Oh, I thought you said in Columbia. All right, no, so you no, think Kingston makes Clemson. Omaha oh, West. Okay. What's your pick? Uh, my answer? Yeah. Um, what happens first? That's a good one. Thanks, James. That is pretty good when he's trying to mess with our heads. I'm going to say Muschamp beats Clemson. All right. Do you think it's more likely to happen this year? No, that's no, not I the question. It's, it's just what, happen, it's more what happens first. In general, you don't have to get period. into the timeline. You don't have to make all these people upset and tell them the news is going to happen for another five years, And Chris. I haven't fleshed it out Leave enough these poor to, people alone. to really, like, man, that's one you've really got to think about, you know? T- or King, you just say one. Which just say I, what, that's, just, that's what I did. Just yeah. say it. I just, just go with your gut. One. You know, you don't need to overthink it. What's your answer? Uh, I think Muschamp beats Clemson. I think it's easier. I think it's easier to just steal a game, basically. But to make it to Omaha has to be a sustained run of excellence through the regional, su- yeah. through the super regional. And not that I don't think Kingston's capable of doing it, but I think you look at the position that both rosters are in. I think South Carolina football's closer to being at that level than South Carolina baseball. It's going to take Kingston probably a couple years to get his guys in there and got to figure out the defense. I think right now, I was talking to Tommy Moody yesterday, the only infielder, the only infield position that is not committed an error right now for South Carolina is shortstop. All other infielders have committed at least one error this season, so plenty to clean up there. But the season is still young. Uh, T. King 4485 wants to know, and I'll let you guys combine for this, the top five must-have guys for the 2020 class. Also, please, no more Nickelback. Top five must-have guys for the 2020 class. Y'all <laughs> combine efforts on this. Okay. Um, you got to start with Tank Bigsby, in my opinion. He's one for Probably me. Probably the number one. One for you. Um, yeah. I mean, must-have, I mean, I guess we're talking about most wanted, Jordan Birch. Two, I think if you start to talk about adding Jordan Birch, to a line that already has Zach Pickens and some of these other guys, Joe Anderson, who I think is going to be really good. This They've recruited so much better at that spot. You add those guys to the same line, all of a sudden you're in really good position. So Jordan Birch, two. Um, Put Wyman at, up there in the top five, maybe. Like Wyman. I think it's important they sign another really good receiver. Yeah. Um, Wyman, three. I'm trying to look through the offer list to jog my memory. Dude, I... He's only a three star, but Desmond Tisdall is a personal, absolute favorite. I was going to say Tisdall or Trenton Simpson just to get you know a, a linebacker. linebacker in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so that'd be four if you four. pick one of those. Yeah, pick one of those guys. Um, and then I will say whatever whatever big time defensive back they ultimately focus in on. Right, and the defensive backboard always shakes out a little bit later, yeah, than yeah. the other positions. It seems like, yeah, right? It, it definitely. Um, will. Yeah. So whatever, whatever money defensive back that ends up being a priority and that they have a good shot with, will be number five. And if and if you don't, if you say we have, we can't say that and have to say a name. I pick. Well, I'm the D-line. executive producer. That's so. right. That's right. Well, not, to, no, to be not determined. yet. You have to. You have to win the bet. Yeah, to be you determined. have to win the bet first. Two more quick questions. Yeah. Uh, Washington Cock wants to know, Wes, which newcomers? I, I don't know why he excluded you, Chris. I guess Wes started the thread. That's so right. I'm going to open this up. Wes, Wes is more and of an Chris, expert. Which newcomers in the 2019 class do you anticipate getting the most snaps on offense and defense? I guess just give me the one guy on each side of the ball that you think will get the most snap. Most snaps. Hmm. Defense, Pickens. defense is easy. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Defense is easy. It's Dixon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, Personal favorite, Pearson Fowler. I don't care if he never plays; he will always be my favorite. Who second leading snap getter on defense? Jamie Robinson. What do you think? Well, I like yes. that. Yeah, I like that. Offense is tougher. Uh, I'm. I'm. There's not there's not a guy that just stands out. There's not it's gonna it's gonna depend on it will be whichever position 
has the most injuries and then the corresponding freshman at that spot. But mm-hmm. I'm going to throw out most of the offensive linemen for case of, for this point. Yeah. Um just say Helensky Trey, and make everybody happy. <laughs> I'm going to go on a limb and say Trayvon Kenyon or uh, yeah. Ryan Helensky. Xavier Leggett. Oh, come on, guys. I was going to go Taquan Johnson because, you know. Um, He's only two star, Chris. Yeah, he can't possibly be any good. <laughs> But, you know, Taquan Johnson, he's he's gone to a semester prep schools. He's a little older, a little more seasoned. And, you know, th- th- there is a need for some receivers to step up. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we should ignore that. So, yeah, Xavier gets one. He's a really good natural athlete, very intriguing talent. I'm just curious to see, you know, how he picks it. He's still adjusting to playing receiver. But if he yeah. comes in and he's adjusted well, then, yeah. Isn't he one of those guys, those from from what you hear, like, you wouldn't be surprised if he just redshirted and didn't play at all this year and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, made an impact down the road. But then you also wouldn't be surprised if he just came in and was just one of those guys that just is naturally yeah. good. Not not whatsoever. I could see that for sure. I mean, because he's just got that much natural sort of athletic abilities. If he can pick things up and play fast early, then I think he's got a chance to contribute. Ryan Helensky, and I'm going to laugh when uh, when y'all are wrong and I am right. Last one from Dwight K. Shoot. Who will be sitting <laughs> on the man. Iron Throne at the end of Game of Thrones? I will have to. Pearson, uh, you can have that. Have don't, did exit. neither of y'all watch Game of Thrones? No, don't have time. Want to. I'll have to exit this question. Are you serious? Dead serious. Buddy. I didn't even, I didn't even like pre-run this by you, you because I was, was so no sure. Possible way. Yeah, well, I mean, right. you, you exist in society, correct? Y'all have cell phones? Like... We do. What, what in is, the world? What is the percentage of people that watch Game of Thrones? It, it's extraordinary. It's. I mean, you can look it up. You have a computer. In front, I mean, I have two computers in front of me, but I'll let you look it up in front of you with your one computer because I'm watching highlights of DK Metcalf and recording this podcast. But uh, you can actually get Vegas odds on that. And right now, the odds on favorite is Bran, which is really weird because he's not even Bran anymore. He's the three eyed raven. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to go. I'm going to go with I think like the third odds on favorite because number two is Jon Snow. I think I'm going to go I'm going to go with Daenerys because she she's the one that wants it the most and I think is in the best position to sit on the throne. Like Jon Snow doesn't want it. Bran again isn't even Bran. He's a three eyed raven. So I don't know. There's a the, the Ringer did a great bod, uh, great podcast on the on the odds uh, who who are the value picks and and who is most likely to be sitting on the Iron Throne at the end of Game of Thrones. Wes and Chris, this is like hugely disappointing. What do y'all watch? Okay. Are y'all like Walking Dead people or something? No. No, not not, not either. Nothing? No. I guess, Chris, you probably just watch cartoons because you have young children. My kids don't watch TV that much. Okay, so your they're kids are going to be smart. They'll watch really weird YouTube videos where they... You know, well, that's the new TV, actually. Stuff. Yeah, people don't, people don't watch. Really what do you watch, Wes? I'm, I mean, I'm a Netflix binger. Um, there's like thousands of shows on Netflix. Do you watch all of them? Yeah. For the most part. <laughs> all of them. Um, Every single one. See, this is what I mean. It's easier to get stuff out of Chris. I'm trying to. I mean, I like a lot of shows. I uh, I like all the Marvel shows. Um, mm. Stranger Things was awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, Breaking Bad is my favorite all time show. Okay. That's great. great. Um, Do you watch uh, uh, Better Call Saul? Yeah, I like Better Call Saul. Not See, quite I, as much as Breaking Bad, but it is very, very. Well I haven't gotten done. into it. Gotten yet. up to um, speed on that. They're making a Breaking Bad movie. Did y'all hear about this? No. Yeah. It's a sequel. So it's what happened to Jesse Pinkman after the end of Breaking Bad, which I'm not very excited about because sequels are. But pretty much always well bad. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I have to trust that if it's the same team, if it's Vince, Vill- if it's Vince Gilligan's crew, that they'll probably do a good job with it. But I don't really want to know. I like, I kind of like the open ended ending for Jesse. But yeah, the Americans was really good. Anybody watch that? You know, I watched like the first season or two of that, and for whatever reason, didn't get super into it. But I, I know a lot of people that like it. It's a well regarded show. It was good. Uh, Wes and Chris, you guys need to watch Game of Thrones. You still have a couple months to to crank it out to binge it uh, before the new season starts on. April 14th. So Dwight K. Shoot, thank you for that question. Thank you, everybody else that posted your question on Gamecock Central that is listening, uh, that's watching on the live feed on Facebook Live right now. If you like it, remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And we will be back next Thursday with another episode of Another Carolina Podcast. Thanks for listening. He's all fired up now. Six to eight points for Wes. Wes, can I get you saying six to eight points? Six to eight points. All right. The over-under for the spread, I'm setting it at South Carolina plus three. I'm going to take the under. You taking that? Wait. Plus three. What? Taking the over. All right. I'm taking the under. 
Carolina will be favored by by the Carolina. The line will be Carol no less than Carolina plus no more than Carolina plus three. Yeah, I, I think I think it'll Wait, be. Wait, how can they be favored if they're plus three? No, no, I'm saying it's not going to be worse than plus three. They're going to be plus three, plus two, plus one, even or favored in this game. And he thinks they're going to be plus four, plus five, okay, plus okay. six. All right. And, and then so on, whoever so whoever gets this, the line right, and whoever gets it is right, the is the executive producer of another Carolina podcast.